whenever I'm asked the question, what is colour? I'm always reminded of these two individuals, the remarks of two people who are very different, very strange individuals who never really even discuss colour at all, but I think their remarks are so useful that it's worth thinking about. The first of them is the early Christian theologian St Augustine, and there's a wonderful line in St Augustine when he says, I know what time is until I'm asked what it is. And you know, it's a brilliant line, and I think it really, uh, the same can be said of colour. Because uh, colour, like time, is a constant companion. It's with us from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night. It even seeps into our dreams. And just as we uh, know what it's like to feel or experience a second or a minute or an hour, um, we know what it's like to experience the beautiful greens of a forest or the blues of a, of a summer sky. And yet, in both of those situations, when it comes to actually trying to pin down what those experiences are, what they actually are, we tend to struggle. And the other individual who I'm always reminded of uh, when I think about what colour is, a very different person, uh, the US Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart. Uh, now, back in the 1960s, Potter Stewart was asked to determine whether a very explicit film by Louis Malle called The Lovers was pornography or not, whether it was obscene or not. And uh, Potter Stewart thought about this for a long time and eventually he, he came up with a conclusion that became very famous when he said, I can't define pornography, but, and this is the famous line, I know it when I see it. And again, I think the same can be said of colour. We all see colour all the time. We all know, even my three-year-old son uh, knows the difference between red and green and yellow and blue, um, and we're surrounded by it all the time. But when it comes to trying to define it in words, to pin it down, once again, as with St Augustine and time, we struggle. And, you know, neither of those people were talking about colour, but I think both of those individuals remind us, I think, for me, that colour is one of those things, one of those things like time, like art, that we know, but we also don't know. And I think that is because colour is an extremely elusive phenomenon. It's something that raises all kinds of complex and intractable philosophical, uh, physical, psychological, uh, neurological questions that we ha still haven't answered. And you know, we've made huge strides in our understanding of the nature of colour over the centuries, but we still don't really have agreement on the most fundamental question of all, which is what colour is. Um, so I think the main debate, the main philosophical debate about what colour is, is whether colour exists out in the world, in things, uh, or in light, or whether it exists in here, in the eye and the mind of the beholder. In other words, whether colour is objective or subjective. Um, now, I want to give you an example. I mean, this is actually, it's not a very exciting example. It's a red notepad. <laughs> I just grabbed it just before the talk started, but I hope that will uh, give you an indication. So I'm going to return to this throughout the talk. Um, so the three main uh, and I'm simplifying hugely, but the three main explanations for what colour is, we can do it in relation to this notepad. So the oldest explanation, and the one that in many ways seems the most commonsensical, is the view that colour actually exists in this notepad. That there is a red pigment or a red dye in the paper and that it is there. It's part of the surface quality of the book, it's as real as the, the pages inside it, and whether we're here or not, whether we're looking at it or not, that notepad is, quite frankly, red. That's the first interpretation. I think the second explanation, which came along a little later, came along in the 17th, 18th centuries, Isaac Newton being the most famous exponent of it, is a subtle modification of the first uh, explanation. It also believes that the colour exists, the redness exists out in the world, that it's, a, it's an objective property. But Newton and his followers said, well, colour isn't actually in the surface of this page. It's actually in the light that comes off it. So colour is part of light, not part of objects in that sense. And we all know the Isaac Newton theory of, you know, the, the experiment when he shone light through a prism and the prism refracted these lights. We all know uh, when you look at a rainbow, you see how white light is refracted into the different prismatic colours. In many ways, this is the theory, even though it's quite an old one, that we're still taught today at school. I mean, I was taught in physics lessons that colour is, you know, wavelengths of light. 
But that brings us to the third explanation. The third explanation is the most recent explanation of what colour is. It's the one that's favoured increasingly by neuroscientists and philosophers. But it's also the one that is, in some ways, most counterintuitive. And these philosophers, these thinkers say that actually colour doesn't exist here. It doesn't exist in the book. It doesn't exist in the light coming off the book. The redness of this book actually exists here inside our brains. I mean, they will say, they will go so far as to say, there is no such thing as colour. There are only the people who see it. And they would say that if there was no one here to see this book, it effectively wouldn't even be read at all. So those are three, um, as I say, simplifying hugely, but those are three main interpretations and ex explanations of what colour is. Now, where do I stand on it? Well, um, in some ways, those three views seem really incompatible with each other, really inconsistent. And yet my view is that all three are correct. That might sound like a fudge, but I do think all three are correct. But I take the view of colour that one of my heroes, the great French painter Paul Cézanne took. Paul Cézanne said that colour was the place where our brain and the universe meet. And that's how I see it. For me, colour is created when light from the world is registered by our eyes and interpreted by our brains. So for me, colour is a process. It's this extremely labyrinthine operation that involves a chain of, of physical, chemical and biological events. Um, so for me, I don't think of colour as a noun. I don't think of it as a thing that just sits there. I think of it as a verb. I think of colour as something that happens. And in order to explain that in a little bit more detail, I think you're going to have to bear with me. I have to tell you, I think, how it actually happens. Now, I'm going to try and do it with as little scientific jargon as possible, as simply, as clearly as possible. And I hope you bear with me. It's only two or three minutes of explanation, because I think once I've finished, I think you'll realise how truly miraculous the process of colour appearing in the world actually is. Um, so I think we have to begin with light, as Isaac Newton was right in that sense, because without light there can be no colour. Now, light belongs to this vast spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, and that spectrum of electromagnetic radiation contains lots of things that we can't see. So it contains X-rays, for instance, which we use to photograph the inside of our own bodies. It contains microwaves, which we use to cook our food. It contains radio waves, which we use to communicate along distances. Uh, it contains uh, ultraviolet and infrared. But within this vast, vast spectrum of energy, if you like, there's one tiny little part of that spectrum. Uh, in fact, it's only 0.035% of that spectrum that is visible to the human eye, and that we call visible light. And visible light is not only responsible for all the colours we have ever seen and probably will ever see, it is responsible for all the things we have ever seen and will ever see. And though it's a tiny little band of energy, it actually has its own spectrum, it has its own range of energy, and it's that distribution of energy, that modification of energy within that visible spectrum that creates the colours that Isaac Newton saw through the prism and the colours that, that we see around us today. So um, the, at the top end of that spectrum, if you like, the most energetic uh, visible light, the light that has the highest frequency and the shortest wavelength, is violet. It comes out of ultraviolet, which is invisible to us, it becomes violet. And then as the energy levels decrease and the wavelengths increase, violet turns into blue, blue turns into green, green into yellow, yellow into orange, orange into red, and then eventually at about 700, 750 nanometers in wavelength, pardon the, uh, the jargon, red slips into infrared and out of sight. Um, so where does this light come from? Well, partly it comes from the, the lights we have around us, the lights that are illuminating me here, but of course the leading emitter of visible light in our solar system is the sun. The sun which uses nuclear fusion to create immense amounts of light and heat. So it creates all these photons of light, the sun, it beams them across the solar system, they arrive on the earth in about just over eight minutes, they 
they clatter through our atmosphere, they bounce through clouds, and then eventually when they get down to the surface of the Earth, they hit everything. They, cr they, they crash into landscapes and objects and people and all these kinds of things. And it is that set of violent interactions, if you like, between light and materials, between energy and matter, that is in many respects the crucible of colour. Now, all materials have different qualities, different structures, different properties, and uh, they all interact with light differently. So, for instance, let's take an example, snow, for instance. So if the light from the sun were to hit the snow on the top of a mountain, snow reflects most wavelengths of visible light, and so it appears white. Uh, dark soil, by contrast, absorbs most wavelengths of visible light, and so it appears almost black. But most materials, most things, absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect others, and that is what makes them colourful. Uh, so I'll give you one example there, um, leaves, grass for instance. Leaves and grass uh, are green because they contain this absolutely miraculous uh, elaborate pigment molecule called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll of course which produces photosynthesis and is therefore responsible for life on our planet. But chlorophyll has this ability to absorb most wavelengths of light and to reflect the green and yellow light back out at us. And that is what makes leaves and plants uh, appear green. It's quite a mystery actually that they're green. If anyone wants to ask that question in the Q&A, it really is mysterious that they're green. It doesn't make any sense at all. So let's go back to my little red book. I'm, well, I'm beginning to sound like Mao, aren't I? But this is the little red book. Um, what happens here, if we imagine it, is let's say it's daylight, but even here with the normal lights, the light, the white light comes down, it hits the surface of this book. This book does, as the first explanation made clear, it does contain a synthetic red pigment that uh, produces the red colour in our eyes. And what that does is it does just what chlorophyll does, but for different light, for, uh, light sources. What it does, it absorbs all wavelengths of light, but it reflects uh, wavelengths of light that appear red. So about 690, 700 na uh, nanometers uh, light is bounced back. Now what happens is it bounces back towards us. And as that light bounces back towards us, that red light, as uh, we might call it, bounces back towards us, it clatters into our bodies. Some of it hits our cheek, some of it hits our nose, some of it hits our head. But a small amount of that light miraculously makes its way through the holes of our pupils and swims through the liquids in the eye and eventually strikes the retina at the back of our eyeballs. And there, four or five million cone cells, colour receptors, lie in wait. Um, so humans have three types of cone cells. We have cone cells sensitive to the bluey violet light, we have cone cells particularly sensitive to the yellowy green light, and we have uh, cone cells receptive to the orangey red light. So what happens is um, the light, when it hits those cone cells, something extraordinary happens. Uh, the cone cells, as, as they receive these photons, they a bond within them snaps. They change shape, and as they change shape, they trigger an extraordinary set of events. So as a cone cell changes shape, what happens is that it activates a protein, and that activates another protein. And then those proteins convert the stimulation of the retina, those photoreceptors, into electric signals to a sort of binary code or Morse code that we know as action potentials. And those electrical signals then exit our eye through the optic nerve, they travel very, very fast through these fluid-filled uh, vessels through our head, and they emerge at the back of our brain uh, in the primary visual cortex. Now, it's what, something that's really important to say here, is that right up until, this is a very important point that I want to sort of land, is that right up until that point, I've explained quite a complex process, but right up until that point, there really is no such thing as colour. There are wavelengths of light, there are vibrations of light, there are electrical signals, but they're not colour. They only become colour in the brain when the brain undertakes this complex computation of addition and subtraction, where it converts those electrical signals into the red we always presumed only existed in the book. So that red is only activated here. So it's a fascinating, uh, a really fascinating phenomenon. 
And I hope that in that sort of brief description of how colour happens, there are a couple of points I want you to take away from it. One is that it's a process, as I said earlier. It's, it, it's not just one thing. It doesn't exist only in one place. It, it depends on lots of different chain of events uh, to, to occur. And the second thing I want you to take away from it is that though in many respects the conditions for colour, so the surface, textures, the pigments, the dyes, the light, though they exist outside of us, colour itself is only really made inside of us. And that is one of the reasons why um, we all see colours in different ways. So there are some men, lots of men in fact, we think about eight or nine percent of men, who lack one or more fully functional cone types. And so that makes them colourblind, so they see fewer colours than everyone else. There are some, we believe, extremely lucky women who by virtue of a rare chromosomal mistake on the X chromosome, uh, might have a fourth cone cell, so they might be tetrachromats, which would give them a fourth dimension of colour vision, which would mean they may be able to see hundreds, if not millions more colours than everyone else. And that's an extraordinary uh, phenomenon. But even those of us with normal colour vision see things differently. I have no doubt, because we all have slightly different hardware, slightly different software in our bodies, I have no doubt that the red of this book is a different red for me than it is for every single one of you sitting there watching this. We all see colours slightly differently. Now, of course, we don't always, uh, we're not always aware of those differences because how can you compare your own personal experience of the world, your own subjective experience of the world objectively with experiences of others? But every so often, things do emerge that remind us of how different our perceptions of colour actually, actually are. Um, I'm sure all of you will remember a few years ago when that terrible photograph of that terrible dress went up online and it became this huge viral, I probably shouldn't say viral anymore in this circumstance, but um, it became this huge viral sensation around the world. And the reason it became so, so popular and so wildly popular was because though everyone was looking at the same photograph of the same dress, no one could agree on its colour. Some people thought it was black and blue and some people thought it was white and gold. Now, I'm happy in the Q&A to explain why that disagreement actually existed. But I think the point that I would like to take from this is I think that it's a perfect example, that photograph, bad photograph and bad dress though it was, is a perfect example of how so much of colour lies in the eye and the mind of the beholder, how so much of colour is an act of interpretation. It's the way that our brains make sense of the crazy wavelengths of light that scatter and bounce and rattle around us on this planet. So I guess I've answered, I hope, uh, one of the big questions about what is colour. I've, I've given you a philosophical and a perceptual explanation, but I think it's also really important to remember that colour is not just a visual experience. Uh, colours affect our minds and our bodies in all kinds of ways. They help us understand when to wake up and when to go to bed, what to eat, what to buy, who to find attractive, what emotions to feel, how to behave. They are constantly shaping our moods and our behaviours all the time, though we're rarely aware of them doing so. They are really, there was a book about colour that calls them a hidden or secret influence. They have this huge influence on the way we behave. And I thought I would just give three examples of three different colours to tell you how that actually happens. Uh, the first colour is blue. Blue is, as we'll discuss in, I think, next week's lecture, blue is the most uh, popular colour in the world. In fact, every country in the world calls blue their favourite colour. And we know from studies that blue really does uh, reduce heart rates, it reduces blood pressure, and it, it really does relax us. I mean, this is one of the reasons why that famous um, erectile dysfunction pill Viagra, why it's blue. 
It's blue because the, the, the manufacturers, Pfizer in fact, the manufacturers of Viagra realised that one of the contributors to men's uh, problems in this domain was anxiety. They were worrying about it and they thought that if the pill was blue it might have a slight effect on relaxing them just that little bit more for when the time came to perform. Um, but you know, on a more serious note, blue has been used to relax people in, in quite sort of dramatic ways. So uh, in the early 2000s there was a spate of suicides in Japan where Japanese men were jumping into the, the, the oncoming trains from train stations and, um, and crossings. And after lots of theories and lots of research about this, and uh, the, the Japanese railway operators decided to install blue lights at train stations and at crossings in the hope that those lights might relax these suicidal men and help bring them back from the brink of suicide. And the introduction of those lights uh, amazingly coincided with an 84% reduction in suicide in those particular places. Another colour that, that, that has been found to affect our minds and our bodies in really exciting ways is green. Um, Green, in fact, has been found to have hugely curative possibilities. A very important study was done in the 1980s when these um, patients who'd just come out of surgery uh, were divided and sent in two di directions. So thousands of patients were, were sent to recover in green rooms with views of trees outside the window, and thousands of them were sent to non-green rooms with no views of trees outside the window. And they found that the patients in the green rooms recovered from their surgery much more quickly and with fewer complications than the patients in the non-green rooms. Uh, other studies have shown that, that if, you, if you use lots of green in neighbourhoods, so lots of grass, lots of green signage, uh, it reduces antisocial behaviour, it reduces gun crime. A big study in the United States of 100,000 women found that the, pe the women living in the most green neighbourhoods were 12% less likely to die of non-accidental deaths than the people in the least green neighbourhoods. So green has these extraordinary uh, consequences as well and impacts on us as well. And the final colour, and perhaps the colour that has the greatest impact of all, is the colour of my little red book. It's red. Uh, red has been found uh, in, in a number of studies to increase heart rates, to increase electrical activity in the brain, um, to contribute to sexual arousal, both for men and for women, uh, to improve the body's speed, strength and reaction times, and to encourage more competitive and risk-taking behaviours. Um, so if I give you one more study, this was an extraordinary study done during the 2004 Olympics in Athens, and the researchers looked at four combat sports. I think it was um, judo, taekwondo, boxing and wrestling or something like that. Uh, combat sports in which the competitors were randomly assigned red or blue outfits. And uh, they went on the assumption that because these were random assignations that it would, they would have no correlation with the outcome of the contest. But they actually found that the, 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 the competitors in the red strips were 20% more likely to win uh, simply by virtue of wearing red. So, you know, some of these studies are extraordinary, some of these studies should be taken with a pinch of salt, but I think all of them show that when it comes to asking that question, what is colour? It's important to say that colour is not just something we look at, it's not just something we see. It's not just a visual phenomenon. Colour is something that gets under our skin and it changes us and affects us in very profound and fundamental ways. And that brings me, I think, to my, my final definition of colour. So we've done the philosophical, we've done the perceptual, we've done the psychological and the psychosocial. Now I want to deal with the cultural definition of colour. And that's a really important one not to miss out because, you know, humans have... Um, made colour an integral part of their civilization, an integral, integral part of their culture for hundreds of thousands of years. We know that tens of thousands of years before even the first cave paintings were made, that humans, our ancestors living in Stone Age Africa, hundreds of thousands of years ago, were mining, excavating, processing, trading and using red pigments in extraordinary quantities. Uh, we know this from the archaeological record and anthropologists believe that these red pigments that we use in such huge quantities 
were uh, thrown onto bodies, they were painted onto bodies. Perhaps the origin of all art is body painting. And they were thrown into graves. We know that from the archaeological record, that they were thrown into graves. The dead were buried with them. And the anthropologists believe that uh, these red pigments were proxies or symbols for blood, and therefore for uh, fertility, virility, life, death, and so on. And some anthropologists believe, and I think there's quite a lot of credence in this, that it's possible that red, the colour red, was humanity's first ever symbol its first ever kind of form of communication in that sense. And I find that utterly fascinating. And of course, over subsequent centuries, we became really adept as a society at developing all kinds of new colours. Uh, so we, we, we created wonderful blues, wonderful purples, wonderful greens. I mean, the colours uh, went, you know, but mushroomed in the Neolithic period, and then again in ancient Greece and Rome, and then again in the Renaissance, and then again in the 19th century. Um, so we made more and more and more colours, and we made more and more meanings with those colours. So, for instance, in, in ancient Mediterranean, uh, purple, uh, this extraordinarily expensive dye that was made from shellfish uh, that were crushed and the, uh, the, 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 the gland extracted from them. Uh, purple became a symbol of royal and imperial power. We still say born into the purple as a saying even now. Um, in, the Muslim, in the Islamic world, green became a symbol of Muhammad and paradise. And in China, uh, red became the colour of good luck and good fortune. And, you know, even today in China, you see red absolutely everywhere. You know, uh, Chinese people string up red lanterns when they're celebrating the new year. They paint their doors red to ward off bad spirits. They, uh, if you have a new baby in, uh, in, in, in China, red gifts and red clothes are given to the baby. Red letters are given to the baby. If people get married, many Chinese women get married in red dresses. Um, that it has this hugely auspicious connotations. Even back here in the UK, you know, if you go to a Chinese restaurant, you'll often find the sign is red. If you buy that Chinese chilli oil, which my wife and I are completely addicted to this Chinese chilli oil, it's, it has red labels because red is the, the, the colour of good luck. And in fact, it's so entrenched in Chinese culture that China is one of the few places in the world where its stock market shows rising stocks in red rather than black. Um, so I think what I'm trying to say is that the, the meanings of colours, the symbols of colours, are very different uh, in different parts of the world. But I think one thing I discovered in the course of writing my book is that there are certain meanings, certain symbols, that are transcendent of time and place. There are meanings that are so elemental and so archetypal, if I can use that word, that they appear all over the place. And those ones we've already talked about red and blood, but also black and darkness or black and death. Uh, we look at yellow and the sun, blue and the sky, white and purity, which we'll discuss and I'll discuss in a couple of weeks in my uh, third talk, I think, here. Uh, green and vegetation. These meanings are really deep rooted and it's very hard to shake them. And I think, you know, the point that I'm trying to make on this. When it, to bring it back to that question of what is colour, is to say that from a cultural perspective, colour is a language. It's a universal language that from those ancient symbols of, you know, of Mediterranean purple to the road signs and the traffic lights we, we work with today, to the, the idea of wearing black clothes to a funeral, that those colour meanings, that language of colour, is still with us. It really is a universal language that we use to communicate very important things to each other still. And, you know, during the course of my book, I did reach the conclusion, I think, that I think colour is perhaps the most powerful bearer of meaning that humans have ever created. More so even than language, because pre-literate and illiterate societies can use it, and because it speaks to us with such a direct and vivid voice. So that's my answer there, is that colour is a language, colour is a form of culture. Now just to conclude uh, this talk, I want to conclude with um, a society that was uh, one of the great masters of colour. They produced some of the first synthetic colours, uh, they used colour in extraordinary ways, they were very alive and alert to the brilliance and the beauty and the radiance of colour, uh, and that is the ancient Egyptians. Now, the ancient Egyptian word for colour was iwan, 
sounds like a strange word, but Iwan was also a word that meant skin, uh, nature, character, and being. And it was represented in part by the hieroglyph of a human hair. Now, the ancient Egyptians, I think, had noticed a striking resemblance between colours and humans. In fact, for the ancient Egyptians, colours were just like people. They were full of, you know, power and personality and life and energy. And I think we now understand, just as the Egyptians could only sense, we understand how entangled colour and humans actually are. Because if you think about it, going back to what I said at the start, for all the wonderful colours that surround us, whether it's the beautiful blue uh, cloudless sky or an incredible golden sunset or the, the extraordinary change of colours uh, in the leaves in the autumn, all of those colours that we believe to be part of the world, all of them ultimately are made in here in this grey matter. They're made in the same place that, that creates thoughts and language and consciousness itself. And so I think if I had to just finish by explaining what I think colour is, I would say that in some ways colour is us and we in some respects are colour. Thank you.